Good morning. Let's stand together and sing How Great Thou Art. It's number 38, 38 in your hymn books. Number 38, How Great Thou Art. Of, your, of you sending your son, not sparing your own son, but delivering him up for us. Our hearts again echo back, God, how great you are. And then when we realize that there is coming a day that with a shout of acclamation, you'll take us to our true home. Lord, may you use this time together today to build our faith that we would be faithful to you 
until that day of your return. May you use this time to realize in even a greater sense what a great God you are. And Lord, ultimately, we want you to be pleased with our thoughts, our words, our singing, our fellowship here today. And in order for that to happen, Lord, your spirit will need to do a work in us because in and of ourselves, we can't do that which brings glory to you. So we depend on your spirit and we rejoice that you are willing to work in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I do have to think, and maybe it's just the way it is this morning, but um, when, when the words are up there, it sounds a little better because we're not down here like, I'm not trying to create a controversy here, but um, I won't ask Jason if he agrees or not, but at any rate, we're, we are what we are here today, and we serve a great God, and we're here because of the Word of God. The chief doctrine that we have is that the Bible is our only rule for authority and practice. That's all we have, and that's all we need. And rejoice today that the Bible stands. Let's turn to number 292. Number 292, the Bible stands.
And what a blessing, regardless what goes on around us in this world, that it can be well with our souls. Romans chapter 15, if you turn there, please. We are this week and next week wrapping up our study in the book of Romans, and we will be then moving on into the book of Ephesians. But Romans 15 is where we're at this week. I'll begin reading in verse 1 and read the first 13 verses. We then who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each one of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mouth mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, <clears throat> for this reason, I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. <clears throat> and again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he sh who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles shall hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Invite you to turn to number 476, All That Thrills My Soul, 476, <coughs> number 476.
pages into Romans, well your six or seven pages in may be different than somebody else's, so it helps us find our way around the Bible, but <clears throat> we get in our minds that, well, that chapter ended and so it's on to something new, but really, um, as you recall, in chapter 14, he was giving instructions to the believers how to work out this transformed life, what it should look like as it comes out of our life. And we saw last week, he said, don't despise one another, <clears throat> like uh, they don't get it, they have liberty here and there. And on the other hand, he said, don't condemn others by saying, oh, they aren't as spiritual as we are, that if they were, they knew they wouldn't, shouldn't be doing this or that. And he says, rather live for God's kingdom and pursue peace. All of these are in chapter 14. And he says, don't destroy the work of God by, by you holding on to your pet doctrine or pet peeve and using it as a wedge to destroy the work of God. He said, don't be doing that. There, it, the work of God is much more important than any of our egos, than any of our um, get it right my way or whatever. So he says, whatever you do, don't destroy the work of God and live with the clear conscience. And so he, he's saying all that, and he was talking about the strong and the weak. And so he begins chapter 15 we then who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. And he goes on and he holds forth, even Christ did not please himself, but came as a servant. Now honestly, it's, it's relatively easy to, um, to talk about these things, but when it gets into the nitty-gritty of real life and you have a, a firm belief in one area and somebody has a firm belief that's opposite to your firm belief in these areas of gray, it's easy then <clears throat> to depart from the exhortations you give, pursue peace, don't get in destroying the work of God, and don't condemn, don't despise. It's easy for us to, to neglect those things and get where in our heart and mind, you know, we're, we're all real good at it, smiling with someone, and in our mind, we're thinking other thoughts rather than smiling, and God knows the heart, and God knows what's going on inside us, and so... Paul is saying all these things, but on a, if we're honest with ourselves, we say, wow, this is, this is hard. And, and really, it's more than hard. It's, it takes the supernatural work of God. And in chapter 15, he's continuing this, and, and he, really, he really brings out, and, and this may maybe kind of sublimely bringing out that this that God's called us to do and to be like Christ and not pleasing ourselves is very difficult, but 
God is able to give us the power to do it. <clears throat> and the only way that we're going to be able to do it is if it's through God. And in essence, Paul says three times in this chapter, the God, and then he says something about God. And really, these three things we want to look at this morning, and they are key for us in the world that we live in to live a transformed life. Because if God is this, it should produce something in our daily lives, in the nitty-gritty of life, it should produce a transformed life. If we really believe God is this. And, and so the question is, if God is this, where is God in our life? And, and that's something we really need to examine in our own life. We're called to be the light. We're called to be the salt. And so we want to look at the three things, three of the things that, that Paul called our attention to in Romans chapter 15. And, and you'll get into more of the details of the chapter um, in, the, in your groups tonight. But you notice, as we said, he said, don't live to please yourself. Even Christ pleased not himself. And then you notice verse 4, For whatsoever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he says here, the God of patience and comfort, he's praying, may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded as fellow believers pursuing peace. Be like-minded that we may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. Now the key in that, it is the God that he mentions here of patience and comfort. We're, we're going to mention it as the God that gives endurance and comfort. In dealing with life, there are situations that we need patience or endurance. Literally, the, the word that is used here is, is a word that <laughs> That means um, remaining under some discipline, subjecting oneself to something which demands an acquiescence of my will to that which I would normally rebel. This is patience, endurance. And it's God, the God of all patience, endurance, and it's, it's not just a, a, a bearing up under a heavy load with a, a grin and bear it attitude, but a triumphantly facing difficult circumstances, knowing that even in this, God promises to produce good in it. It's... Literally, the word means cheerful endurance. Now, we're not going to be able to do that in and of ourselves. It's, it's the attitude of a soldier who in the thick of battle is not dismayed, but fights stoutly and resolutely whatever difficulties may come. So, in living life with Christians, we need to bear up under many things. And not just, oh, I'm going to endure it. Rather, cheerfully endure 
and, and understand God is using this, as we already saw in Romans, in the sanctification process in my life, and not only in my life, but in the lives of others. It is, it is understanding um, the, the aspect that this is hard for me, and my natural response would not be what God's called me to do. But the God that gives endurance is my God. Jerry Bridges said, makes an interesting distinction. He said, endurance is the ability to stand up under adversity. Perseverance is the ability to progress in spite of it. And, and really, the, the two English words, endurance and perseverance, are translations of the same Greek word that is used here. And it is, to sum it up, it is a godly response in adversity. So, in the sanctification process, there come some difficult situations. And it's not just, oh, I'm going to bear up. When will this go away? It's cheerfully enduring, and it's progressing, growing more Christ-like, even in the midst of it, because nothing comes into our life to be wasted. God has a purpose for everything that comes into our life. So it's not, not just, when will this pass? Lord, take this away. God, remove this. God, remove this. No, it's going to God and saying, God, you are the God of patience and endurance and, and perseverance, and, and I need your power. And I, I, I can't bear up under this. You know I want to respond in this way, and God, that doesn't glorify you. You are the God of patience and comfort. And the key in all this, he said right before that, the things that were written were written for our learning. That we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, we get the endurance and the comfort to continue through the scriptures and specifically through the Old Testament. That's specifically what he is referencing here. See, many times we're, we're prone, we're New Testament Christians, we're prone to just focus on the New Testament. But he said, I wrote the Old Testament for your learning because in this life you are going to need endurance and perseverance and you're going to need comfort. And he said, I am the God of all endurance, and I provide comfort, and he says, I've designed to do it through the scriptures, specifically what he's writing, what Paul is writing here, through the Old Testament. If we, if we neglect the word of God, we will not be able to have the strength to cheerfully endure we will not be able to have the comfort that ministers in our heart and life. But if we, through the scriptures, saturating the scriptures, we're going to see that God proved true for Noah. And we're going to see, how long was Noah? Wow, Noah's been 120 years just, just preaching. I haven't even lived just barely over half of that. And we're going to see, that's the same God as mine. And we're going to read about Abraham. And God made promises to Abraham, and it looked like they would never be fulfilled. And we learn from Abraham, you don't want to take things into your own hands and think you're going to do it, because that we're still bearing the consequences of that decision in our world today. But Abraham, by faith, waited on the Lord, and God blessed him. 
You're going to read of many others. You're going to read of Gideon. And, and in Gideon's life, God called him and said, you're going to go deliver the Israel. Not me. I'm, I'm in here in hiding. And he said, no, you're going to. And he said, these are the men you're going to go with. And, and he said, nope, that's too many, and that's too many, and that's too many. Here, take 300 men. So go against tens of thousands. Why, that doesn't make any sense at all. But God empowered Gideon and those men, and God brought the victory. And we're reminded that's the same God that we serve. And you read about Israel, and they served God, and they went away from God, and they served God, and went away from God, and you read it, and you might get frustrated. When will these Israelites ever learn? And that's when God taps on your shoulder and said, you're looking in a mirror here. What you see in Israel is what I see in you. We go to God, then we go away. We go to God when it's really bad, and when it's good, we go away. And he says, I ended up proving faithful to the Israelites, and I will prove faithful to you. You'll read of David. You'll read of Joseph. You'll read of Job. You'll read of Elijah and Elisha and the prophets. All of those things aren't just stories that God said, oh, what will they teach in Sunday school if I don't give this? No, they're to minister encouragement and comfort and it's a tool that God has designed to bring the God of all encouragement and comfort and endurance into our life so that we will be able to endure whatever comes in this life. And this is the God, the God of endurance. I can't go on, God. And we go to God, the God of endurance, to get the power to endure. And God uses his word to help us with that. It's clearly a supernatural work of God. It's something, when something happens in our life that is hard and painful and frustrating and disappointing, it's used of God to bring us to the very heart of God to get the strength to endure, to get the comfort for our, our wounded hearts. Someone has said, it is better to go through the storm with Christ than to have smooth sailing without Him. Think of that in light of our nation. We've had some smooth sailing, but it's been without Him. It's better to go through a storm with Christ than to avoid all the storms and not have Christ. And I believe that God is allowing things to happen in our nation, but he allows things in our individual lives too to drive us to this God that is so many things, but one of the things he is, he is the God of endurance, patience, perseverance, and comfort. But then, notice if you look in verse 13, Paul reminds them again, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope Work in you so that you abound in hope. Again, it's all tied to God. And, and it is. God is the one that gives hope. And the hope that he uses here, when you read of hope in the Bible, it's not, boy, I hope that happens. I hope it doesn't snow tomorrow, or I hope it does snow, or whatever. No, it's a... It's completely different than that. It is a confident expectation. It is, I rejoice that God said this is going to happen, and it is going to happen, and I am counting on it. I have all confidence in it. And this is the God that gives hope, and Paul is saying that I'm praying 
that you will get from the God who gives hope so that you are abounding in hope, looking forward with expectancy and delight because of the certain glorious things that are in the future. You understand a dejected, distressed, discouraged saint is yielding to a spirit that is completely contrary to the God of hope. God is a God of hope. And when we, in the midst of this life, this sanctification process as believers, are, are down and, and discouraged and dejected as our nature, there, there will come bouts of that. And what do you do with it? Do you run to the God of hope? It is only God that gives hope. And it is that inward peace, that, that sufficiency that is not affected by the circumstances around us, a biblical joy. But you notice what he says here. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. This hope comes when we actually believe what God says. Not just here, but when it comes to reality and the time. Wait a minute. I, I, I know God said this. I know God said that he will make all things work together for good. And God, I'm counting on that. God, I know you said you will never leave me nor forsake me. And, and it, it really may feel like it right now that, that you have God. I feel forsaken, but I believe you are with me. And I am resting in that. And when we, when we put our belief that turns into action, the evidence of belief is what it does in our life. It will produce, the God of hope will produce joy and peace in believing by the power of the Holy Spirit. The God of hope cannot fill us with joy and peace if we don't believe, that means if we don't act on what we know. It is when we believe and act on what we know that then the Holy Spirit begins the work in us to help us to abound in hope. The abounding hope pushes out all the other devices of Satan to come into our heart and soul and to get us to be worn down. When we focus on God, we will be given hope. Confident expectation. In Philip's translation of this verse, he says, May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in your faith, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, your whole life and outlook may be radiant and alive. I like that. May the God of hope, because of who he is and the future he's promised, may it fill our lives to be radiant and alive. Wow. That's what God's, that's what God's done for us. And it should be manifested here and, and in the reality of this life. So the reality, if you are not abounding in hope, we need to consider that we need to go to God and we need to make this our prayer. God, may the God of you, your hope, be spread abroad in my heart by the Spirit of God. Show me what is hindering this. And Lord, I want to be alive and radiant in you. You know, it's easy for us to get caught up. It's easy for me to get caught up in what's wrong in this world. And what's wrong in this world, 
focusing on that is never going to make me to be radiant and alive in hope. And I think in our Christian circles in our nation, the last six months or six weeks or two weeks, it's been easy for us to get our eyes off God and we've lost the radiance and the life that our God is a God that gives hope. And the world is desperately saying, where is their hope? And we're saying, ah, there is no hope, man. This is bad, and that's bad, and everything's bad. <coughs> and God is the God of endurance and comfort. He is the God of hope. And look at verse 33. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Three things Paul reminded. God is a God of endurance and comfort. He is a God of hope. He is a God of peace. Peace is the opposite of division and dissension. And peace is a state of harmony and concord and oneness. And you look through Paul's epistles and he's always talking about the peace of God and dwell together in peace because this is the heart of God. God is a God of peace. In Philippians 4, he said, those things that you have learned and received and heard in me, do them. And the God of peace will be with you. He wrote to the church at Thessalonica in chapter 5 and verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and body and soul will be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord. So he's saying God is a God that gives peace. Contrary to anxiety, a God that gives peace, contrary to division and fighting, a God that gives peace, contrary to the, the bickering or any of that, contrary to the restlessness, he's a God of peace. We sang, how great thou art. We ought to be, again, saying, God, how great you are. You are a God that enables me to endure, and not only endure, but cheerfully endure and comfort me during it. And God, not only that, you are a God that gives hope, that, that I have hope and the best is yet to come. And not only that, God, but in the midst of that, it is well with my soul. I have peace. Now, I don't know about you, but those three things challenged me in my spirit, and I, and I thought, man, there's been, there's been a lot of days here lately that I've forgotten, that I haven't made my focus, that God is the one that will give me the strength to endure and the comfort to do it, and God is the one that will give me hope and God is the one that will give me peace, I had better be running to God. I had better make him my focus. See, is there evidence of God in your life by the endurance that you show? How you bear up under difficult things and not just bear up, but cheerfully bear up? <coughs> And the comfort that you have in that, <clears throat> is there an evidence of God in your life by the hope that you have? The confident expectation, man, I, I know how this ends. The best is yet to come. And um, with a shout of acclamation, he'll call me home. And we have that hope. Is there evidence of God in your life? By the peace that you manifest. See, in every one of those, when there's a lacking of peace, 
It's, it's the dashboard light going off and saying, you need to get your focus back on God. And, and in the current climate that we're in, this is a reminder to us. Wait a minute. All this is going on. You see all those executive orders he signed? Man, what's going to happen? And so I'm saying this. When you hear me talking like that, I want you to say to me, but pastor, God is a God of hope. Seriously, we need to help each other. How many of you have been prone to have no hope? Raise your hands. How many of you have been prone? You've been angry about things going on. Okay. How many of you have been angels and nothing's bothered you and everything's wonderful? <laughs> we need to help each other to get our focus back on God so that when it says, man, look at this and look at this, yeah, but God is a God of endurance and if we run to him, he'll give us the strength to endure. But God, that's what we need to say. But God can give me peace. But God gives hope. But God gives endurance and comfort and wisdom. And, and we just mentioned the three things about God from chapter 15. But I, I don't know if I can get along with that. But God is the God that will give me the strength to be able to bear up and respond properly in adversity to the glory of God. Do you realize what a great God? It, we limit it is well with my soul, the song, to just that he saved us. It ought to be well with our soul all the time. It was well with Joseph's soul. The comfort and the instruction of the Old Testament I mean, none of us have faced what Joseph went through. It was well with his soul. It was well with Stephen's soul. Man, God called him to preach. He preached the word of God and didn't even get to the invitation. They picked up stones and stoned him, and he was praising God even as he died. How does that happen? It wasn't Stephen. It was the God of endurance and comfort and hope and peace. And that's the same God you have and the same God I have. And, and that's what he's called us to. And to realize, man, God, God has everything we need for this life. And it, it probably won't be the way you want it to be. But tell me how much of your life has gone just the way you exactly wanted it to go. But God is the grand designer, isn't he? He is the grand weaver. And you can trust him that he is weaving this together to make something to the praise and the glory of God. Not just your life. He's including your life in the grand picture of all of history. And he has faithfully been the God of endurance and comfort through all these generations. And now we're the ones that are in the weaver's beam, so to speak. We're the ones that he's weaving through. And he says, hey, just let me remind you from the Old Testament and the New Testament. But let me remind you, I was weaving in all of these people's lives to my glory and I'm still doing the same thing today in your life. Okay. Okay, God. You got it under control. Man, that's nice to know. I can rest in that. And we can. We'll never, ever be able to say, God, you made a mistake right here when you did this. Never. And everything in our life has a purpose to point us to him. Either one, to bring us to salvation, or two, to make us like Christ. In every life, we know those are all the purposes 
of what he's doing. And his heart is one that provides comfort and endurance and hope and peace. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help me to reflect the power and the glory of you. Because you are a God of patience and endurance and comfort. You are a God that provides and gives confident expectation for the future. And you are the God of peace. So Lord, we ask that we would be reflectors of your character as we trust you. Trust your word and manifest that trust in our obedience to you. So Lord, you know we're weak. You know we can't do these things of loving one another and, and not pleasing ourselves and, and serving others and pursuing peace. Lord, we can't do it. But through you, we can so, Lord, may we know the power of you at work in our lives so that we would live radiant lives that are alive in the power of you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, many of our songs that have been written over the years were written out of very difficult situations. And yet, they were depending upon the God of endurance and comfort and hope and peace. Swiss pastor Ulrich Zwingli, one of the most influential voices of the Reformation, when the Black Plague broke out in Zurich, he raced to minister to the sick. Zwingli caught the dreaded disease and almost died. But he wrote a hymn that gives us a glimpse into his faith. The first part of the hymn was written when the disease came. Here's what he said. Help me, Lord, my strength and rock. Lo, at the door I hear death's knock. Lift up your arm once pierced for me that conquered death and rescued me. Yet if your voice in life's midday recalls my soul, then I obey. He then wrote another set of verses during his illness. <clears throat> and this is what he wrote. My pains increase, haste to counsel. For fear and woe seize body and soul. Death is at hand. My senses fail. My tongue is dumb. Now Christ prevail. He, Satan, harms me not. I fear no loss. For here I lie beneath the cross. In his mercy, God restored him to health when he didn't think he would be, and after his rec recovery, he wrote, My God, my Lord, healed by your hand, upon the earth once more I stand. Let sin no more rule over me, my mouth shall sing alone to thee. Though now delay, my hour will come, involve perchance in deeper gloom, but let it come, my joy will rise and bear my yoke straight to the skies. What a picture of how to bear suffering. I mean, he said, he was raised to health, but he said, though now the hour of my departure is delayed, when it comes, he said, perhaps it'll be an even deeper gloom than what I've gone through. But he says, I will not fear. And then in 1636, the Lutheran pastor in Germany, Martin Rinkart, wrote the song, Now thank we all our God, 
His tiny hometown had been ravaged by the Thirty Years' War. The Swedish army had set siege around the wall of the city. War refugees had flooded into the city, um, crowding the town. And soon after all of that, the bubonic plague hit. And almost 5,000 people in that town alone died in one year. Rinkert was the only pastor left alive to bury the dead. He often performed 40 to 50 funerals a day, including the burial of his own wife. In the midst of such pestilence and heartbreak, this is what he wrote. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices who wondrous things has done, in whom this world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. Can you imagine that? Having gone through all of that and then to be able to, to write that of praise. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices who wondrous things has done. Wondrous things. I've been burying 40 to 50 people a day for days on end. But he, why? Because he was so closely connected to God, the God of endurance and comfort and hope and peace. We're going to close our service by singing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. A bulwark never ending. I'm going to ask Jason if he'll come, but I want you to, to really think of the words. It's number 81. Did we, verse 2 says, Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Just ask who that may be. Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name. From age to age the same. And he must win the battle. I read verse 2. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4. But rejoice. This is who our God is. And this is no time for us to be down in the mouth. We have a God of hope, a God of peace a God of endurance and comfort. In number 81. <laughs>
prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure. Why? We, we have the God of endurance and comfort. Not because of our strength. We know his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. Amen. Rejoice, rejoice that we have a God of comfort and endurance and hope and peace. And he's coming again. Amen. Amen.